last time, our elven hero Anyata DeVoe and her best friend, the human politician Termel Robertson, had come into conflict with a local gangster. Hell-bent on bringing him down, the two had gone so far to burn down the gangster's business, his carriage repair shop. This fight for vigilante justice had been co-opted to push the agenda of the ultra-conservative politician Peter Dominix, who spoke to the assembled crowd the following morning. Behind me stands the latest example of the danger these women's rights activists pose to our society. Bo! A long-standing Bo! local Bo! carriage repair no business it, destroyed yes, he is, by these so don't. You'll get validation. Fighters, who probably could not bear the thought of this hard-working, labor-intensive work not being accepting of their sex. If the sightings of two women fleeing the scene last two night women. are to be I believed, told you, you need to cut that air of yours. Maybe I should grow a beard. Definitely good idea. These activists take part in. First, they blow up post boxes, and their protesting and demonstrations put at risk the lives of those in our society, content to stay in their lane. We must take action to prevent these people destroying all we have dear. They are not content with what we have and will. Kill us all. I will not be taking questions at this time. What a coward that Dominic's. He's just done the political equivalent of passing gas in a crowded room, then leaving as quick as possible. <laughs> You're right, that's exactly what he is. Oi, oi. You want to take a stand against people like Dominic's? Sure, what you got? Here you go. This pamphlet has everything you need to know about the guy. His histories, his policies. We've gone through every bit of propaganda these guys pull out over the last 17 years with a fine tooth and comb. Giving you every bit of information you need to combat any ignorance that comes your way. Sorry, hmm? what was that you said a moment ago? A fine tooth what? Fine tooth and comb? It's a saying. It means to look over something thoroughly. Tooth and comb? That's not right, is it? Yeah, it's just fine tooth comb. Like the gaps of a teeth in a comb are small, but fine. Yeah, that's what I thought, but tooth and comb? Yeah, that means nothing. Like, you eat near or something? <laughs> Probably. Look, you bunch of language swats. Are you going to take this pamphlet or what? It's more of a flyer than a pamphlet, you rude numpty. What'd you call me? I called you rude, you numpty. Oh yeah? What are you going to do about it? Thanks. We'll be on our way. It's a flyer, not a pamphlet. It's one bloody page. I'm... I'll tell you what is weird. Every person I've known who's misused that idiom, they've turned out to be a total dick. For real? Yeah, no joke. Uh, there was these twin brothers I knew in school, rude, arrogant pigs. They tried showing off their language skills, and that fine tooth and comb was always one coming out their mouths. And like countless other people I've met, all dicks. It's not even that common an idiot, fine tooth comb. It's like correlation or causation. Everyone who says it is a dick. <laughs> well, probably not, but everyone I've known who's said it turns out to be one. It's like that thing where you see or read about something for the first time, and then you start seeing it everywhere. Yeah, frequency bias. Or are you just perceiving people as dicks for saying it? I'm going to hear it everywhere, and now, because you've said it, I'm automatically going to think whoever says fine tooth and comb is a dick. <laughs> uh, anyway, I better go. You getting up to much today? Back to research. See if I can figure out who this demon is once and for all. Oh, good luck. I'll see you tomorrow. See ya. Eh, hey, there's a client for you in the tea room. Ah, awesome. Thanks, Charlie. Uh, you're in a mood, are you? You were calling me Charlie. You know I don't like that. Sorry, Charlie. Get in that room. Entering the tea room, she was greeted by the sight of a pale woman wearing what looked to be a ragged black morning dress, dark round rimmed sunglasses, and with hair a mess of orange curls. Hello, Anita DeVoe. How can I help you? My name is Morgan the Black. I heard from our friend by the docks. Tom, you can take on work outside the limits of the law. Mm, I might do. Some laws are more formalities, and in some cases, Laws have had to be broken to bring in change for the better. Mr. Vo, I am not with law enforcement, and I'm pretty sure such questioning would count as entrapment. You do not need to think so hard about your answers. What makes you think I am? I come to you today with a job offer. One that would not only pay extremely well, but also, as you say, bring in change for the better. Okay, what is it? I want you to assassinate Peter Dominix. In a world of magic and mystery, one elf woman fights crime and the forces of evil in her own unconventional way. These are The Misadventures of Agneta DeVoe. Episode 9, Fine Tooth and Co. Written by Royce Pentagast. So, is this a metaphorical assassination? No. A character assassination? 
No. This isn't something with a double meaning? No. You want to kill? As in, in the life of Peter Dominics, the misogynistic politician who was just outside giving a speech? Yes. Well, I mean, it couldn't happen to a more deserving person, but why kill him? I am part of a group that has witnessed people like Dominics in all walks of life. There are different ways to deal with these people. Some can be persuaded away from their harmful ideals. Some can be held accountable, while others require removal. We're meeting someone who is part of this group who will help us in this task. All right, Charlotte, just heading out. Back later. Can I come? What, with us? I mean, I've got nothing else on today. I may as well go out instead of wasting away in here. Uh, uh, sure thing. Come along. Uh, you don't mind? If you think she can be trusted. Charlotte Morrigan. Just don't call her Charlie. She doesn't like that. But yes, she can be trusted. And you'd be surprised how many bodies Charlotte has handled in her time running a pub. Bodies? Oh, God, it's not swingers again, is it? (laughs) So why bring me on board? We have been witness to your work, Mr. Vaux. And know you have what is needed to do this. You mean crime fighting? Yeah, that's hardly a good CV for contract killing. People pretend this world is civilised. But even in your backyard, you can be attacked by an idiot with a dagger after the gold in your pocket. You are a warrior and a rogue. You have the skills to fight and kill. Looks like our contact is here now. The maze that was the docks had been known to attract all manner of criminal life. The trio had stumbled upon the latest conflict, a battle between armored dwarven cartel members and an unseen archer. Show yourself, elven cow! When I find you, your pointed ears are coming off your head! My, my, ain't you a pleasant one? Must be my unlucky week to keep meeting dicks like you. Who the bloody hell are you? I think I must be that elven cow you were just threatening. Oh no, but I will deal with you next! He collapsed to the ground, an arrow from his back, as the mystery archer made her presence known. A tall and skinny elf dressed in masculine clothes, with roughly cut short hair and a scar across her freckled face. You'd think they'd put more armour on their backs. Only this lot spend most of their days lounging about. They design their armour to sit down comfortably. Get them to turn away and you take them. Wham! Right in the spine. Mr. Vo, this is our contact, Neris. That's Neris Alexandria Sarah Philomena Lethbridge, Arcadia Burn Down the Parliament Brian Richardson. Me dad was a bit of an anarchist. <laughs> know what I mean? Anyway, another elf, hey? Interesting. How so? Mr. Vo is a person who does what other people cannot, and she is sympathetic to our cause. Bah! I'm a person who does what other people can't, and I'm already on the team. The more the merrier, surely. More the messier, more luck. But welcome anyway. Who were those lot you just shot? Are they relevant to this Dominic's thing? Nah, bit of a side quest, if you know what I mean. <laughs> heard they were shipping in something valuable. I heard word about a hedgehog, but all they got is grain. Hmm. For a tenner, I'll do your bag of rice. Whatever that is. Tenner for rice? Whatever that is, I'll go for seven. Oh, two of them. Lovely. This was for you to see what we can do, Mr. Vo. Our mission requires much planning, and so you and Neris will be working together at times where needed. Briefing comes later today. At two o'clock, there is to be a gala at the Mayo restaurant. Your friend, Mr. Robertson, will be present. He should be able to see to it you can get in. There we will meet with the manager, and this operation shall go ahead. Charlotte and Agneta made their way to the restaurant. The doors had all been opened to the street, and the tables and chairs cleared for guests to stand about. To their surprise, Prime Minister Anderson was present, finishing up a speech as they entered the building. And it is my hope, in these troubling times, we can band together, no matter our party or our beliefs, and stand tall against whatever threat this country faces. (laughs) To Mel Lizard Robertson. Now, I thought it was you. It sure is, ma'am. I was starting to think you'd left us for good. It's been so long since I've seen you. Now, listen, I do think we need to put you to use with those strengths of yours and make you a valuable member of this government. Your mother Excuse always me, said Prime that. Minister. I think Maud Pandrell is wanting to speak with you. Oh, yes, yes. But Robertson, do come find me later. We need someone like you. Listen, Robertson, if I see you near the Prime Minister again, whether you approach her or not, 
You won't be able to get a job here as a waiter, let alone in politics. Am I making myself clear? She came to me. How was I supposed to? Front gave him a glare before turning and leaving. All right, Dave. How'd you both get in here? Just walked through the door. Something about acting like you're supposed to be here. That and the coming of the air and the clothes. People see the uniforms, not the face. Fine tooth comb. What? Oh, all right. Yeah. Did your new friend say who he's supposed to look for? Probably someone I help. You here for a job? I am. A secret one. Only I know about it too. <sighs> well, if you're after someone high up, you've come to the right place. Prime Minister is here, as are several other senior ministers. Even Dominic is here for some reason. Listening to all this is just part and parcel of the job. Is he going no, to make a speech about the scandal of it's women's no, collarbones? Oh, yeah. Did you read that flyer? Dominic's policies. Guy was literally trying to get rid of women's public toilets. What is the obsession with these guys and toilets? I thought it was just some weird exaggeration. Literally no one has thought about toilets more than these sick dogs. Control. That's what it is. Who else is here? Um, oh, well, there's Maud Pendrel, the suffragette. She's someone I know, but I can't see her now. I thought women here had the right to vote for nearly 200 years. Didn't realise the women's suffrage movement was still about. The movement remains, thanks to the efforts of people like Dominic's, who threaten its continued existence, which is why we must act swiftly and decisively. An older woman had stepped forward, dressed in purple, the buttons of her clothes featuring the image of lilies. Maud Pendrill, I believe our red-haired friend in black organised our meeting. Right, I'll... Uh leave you to it. This is a bit public, considering what we're about to discuss. Less suspicious than meeting in darkened alleyways. I can tell you for certain, we're just having a friendly meeting, as you thank me for my work and I introduce you to my daughter Neris, who you didn't meet earlier. Dressed in a shabby tuxedo with her hair standing on end, the tall blonde elf cut through the crowd to stand with them. What? Cover stories, I get it. Well, Neris is actually my daughter, but the important thing is everyone thinks that what we're discussing, when in truth we plot the removal of a man who's currently standing no more than ten metres from where we are. Well, we're going to do it now, are we? Heavens no. This is just a meeting for myself to see you in person. Tomorrow night, you and Neris will meet outside Miss Evanshaw's tavern, where you will ride west to a storage facility. There, you should find the plans to Dominic's residence. The floor plan is notoriously complex, and finding its blueprints will allow us to plan a more decisive attack. Stealing building plans? Yeah, that is weird. You lot are full on. Which is why it might be in your best interests, Miss Evanshaw, to stay clear of this operation. Until we meet again? The two headed back to the tavern, where Charlotte began to prepare for opening in a few hours' time and Danietta sat in contemplation about tomorrow's mission. So is that what you get up to every day? Sort of. Something about this fell off. I wasn't cramping your style, was I? No, something about this doesn't seem right. You've killed people before, haven't you? Charlotte, the fact that you're saying that so casually is concerning. Like Morrigan Lenoir said earlier, this is a place where you get mugged and killed for spare change, and you fought in a wooer. You told me you were a criminal, so you obviously got up to something there. An assassination, though, of someone like this. There's just so many ways it can go wrong, and they're being so secretive about this. I've got to look into it further. Evening of the next day, Agneta met again with Neris, who pulled up out front in a taxi. Taking public transport to the Iced. Saves either of us driving. Your friend coming too? Charlie! Well, come on. We'd better get going. What about the tavern? It's fine. Ross has it under control, and if anything happens, I have content insurance. Got here the plans to the vestiment. I'll go in, cause a distraction, give you both a shot to get in and out unnoticed. That could work. What were you going to do? Wing Wing it. it. (sighs) My god, you two are so alike. Us? Us? Alike? (laughs) Hardly. After a short while, they arrived at the storage facility, a government building dedicated to planning and infrastructure, adjoining a shipping yard filled with containers and crates. Charlotte entered the building, plans in hand, 
and approached the lone receptionist at the front desk. Good evening, how can I help? Good evening, I'm Charlotte Evanshaw, proprietor of the Vestiment Silver Tavern in 45 Juniper Street. Their back turned, Neris and Nanietta quickly snuck in past the desk and into the archive room. Do you have the code? Nah, just the address. 27 Orland Road. Are you actually going to tell me what the plan for this head is? You need to know info. I'm in on it. I need to know. The plan is to infiltrate 27 Holland Road through one of the secret tunnels in the silts. The building was constructed with fake rooms, staircases that lead nowhere, hidden passageways and traps of security measures 100 years ago. These plans will give us access to the layout to get to Dominic's flat. On the morning he leaves with his security, I exit from a hidden spot in the flat and fire on him as he goes to enter his carriage. After everyone gets a good look at what happened, or trying to find the shooter, you on the road use that magic of yours to set the carriage on fire and click your fingers. Sending a clear message what happens to people like him. And you're telling me this now? Well, you asked for it. Damn, I could barely read some of these labels. I didn't think we'd need a find who've come to find these plants. That's weird. Second time I've heard that in as many days. It's like that thing, uh, what's it called? Frequency bias. Yeah, but yeah, good you said it right. I've had it stuck in my head now that anyone who says fine tooth and comb is a rude, arrogant dick. Fine tooth and comb? What dicks? I reckon here. Ah, 27 Holland Road. Got it. <laughs> Wicked. Time to go. You just hit the fire alarm! Running outside, Neris headed up the road and scaled the wall, disappearing long enough for Charlotte to return. What did you guys do? She hit the fire alarm! Why are you holding a stapler? She enabled me, Charlie. We need to go. Where's she gone? Jumped over the bloody wall. Don't know what she's doing. Getting... <sighs> this <laughs> hunting bow. More powerful than the one I've. Perfect for rooftop snipers. Oh, so a double robbery. Lovely. Are we going to smash and grab a liquor store on the way home? Well, I could do with a drink. But what I need most, Neris, is to see your mother and her pals. I think you guys are going about this all wrong. Oh? Do you know what martyr is? A person killed for their beliefs, deified by their supporters, strengthening their cause with the death of their slain leader. Now, don't get me wrong, assassinations can be cool and all, but you've got to pick your targets right. And some political nut job with a vocal fan base is the perfect candidate for ruining your cause. So what do you mean? What I mean is your plan. A violent public execution is more likely to turn people against you than ever before. With assassinations, you have to ask yourself, what is the goal you're trying to achieve? Do you want to send a message or stop them from doing something? Of those two options, I think the second one is what you're really after. You want to kill Dominic to stop him from enacting his bigoted policies and you want to do so in a way that no one is ever going to martyr or glorify him. What you need is a nice workplace accident. Neris and Morrigan looked to Miss Pendrill. Do continue, Miss DeVoe. What I have here are the plans to the government building where Dominic's officers reside. I got these a while ago while investigating a series of break-ins in the personal apartments. Thing about those break-ins, they've increased security since. So, scaling the outside of Dominic's office ain't gonna work. Which is why we need to take the next best option. The front door. The foyer to the building is open to the public. In the front of the staircase, which is flanked by two guards, there's a receptionist desk. And to the back of the room, there's a door either side. That leads to the staircase for use by staff, with access to the upper floors. It's just that walking into that part of the foyer is going to draw attention, so we're going to need a little distraction to bring people's attention away from that door. Maybe Morrigan, tripping over and dropping your files. Now you're through that door and in the back halls. The nice suit to get you in the front door isn't going to cut it. They tend to pull up anybody they don't recognise and check their IDs. We're going to need a costume change. To the right and round the corner, you'll find yourself a maintenance room. And in that room, you'll find a cleaner's uniform. Failing that, a cleaner to knock out and steal the uniform off. Steal a uniform? Just like that? Sure. Knock them out, stash them in a cupboard so no one stumbles upon them, and you're ready to blend in and get to the upper floors. Do you make a habit of stripping people naked and shoving them into cupboards? Who said anything about naked? Don't steal their bloody underwear. The key to any good disguise is to draw enough attention, but not the wrong kind of attention. A cleaner entering an office to empty a rubbish bin, not a problem. Picking a lock, you're going to get the guards on you. 
Moving upstairs, you're going to need to be careful. There's a lot of people moving about those halls and security is right next to the stairs. But slipping by them and you're on the floor to Dominic's office. So what's your plan for this workplace accident? Well, there's a lot of options. Torn electrical wire in a puddle, falling on a balcony. But you want something that's dramatic. A freak accident preceded by another freak accident so it doesn't seem like a one-off or worse a planned attack. So I present these chandeliers fitted to the ceiling with rope and chain on a bracket with screws that could very easily come loose and lead to a build-up of tension on that rope causing it to snap. A little snap of the fingers, a little flame to break the rope and the whole thing falls 12 feet right onto his head. Oh wow, look at that freak accident, they'll say. All that's needed is to get out of the building, probably back the way I came, change back into the suit and walk right out the front door. Mission complete, five stars, silent assassin, Bosch. Bosch indeed. What is this Bosch you talk of? It means job well done. Dominix is taken out and no one is wise to the fact that it was deliberate. If there's any causes death's going to inspire, it'll be a safety of chandeliers in the workplace, not whatever hate speech he's been spouting. This plan is better. Indeed. Why didn't we consider something like this sooner? Because it's boring. That's why. Smart, yeah, but boring. And if you want me taking part in this, this is the way to do it. Or alternatively, maybe we just rough him up and scare him a bit. No killing needed. No? Okay, well, based on your facial expressions, we'll go with the accident kill. Too easy. The day of the hit. The plan unfolded just as Anyetta had laid out. As Morrigan caused a distraction, Anyetta slipped to the back halls, disguising herself in a pair of cleaner's overalls and carrying a ladder and toolbox upstairs. No one gave her a second glance as she ascended the building, before encountering her first obstacle. A security door next to the guard station, a new addition not on the plans, blocking her way up. Could I help you there? Sorry? Just a minute. Let me open the door for you. Oh, thanks for that. We're supposed to keep it shut, but just kick the wedge under. Steadying her breath, she continued up to the third floor. Wandering the halls, she quickly identified Dominix at work in his office, before heading down to a deserted room and beginning to loosen the chandelier from the ceiling, setting it to snap in a few minutes' time thanks to a slow-burning flame. Right on schedule, the chandelier fell. Those around gathered about, bewildered by this freak accident. A a perfect setup the for ceiling. one more fatal. Seriously? Yeah, just smashed to the ground. There's glass everywhere. We've got some maintenance around to check the others. Good idea. I'll have a meeting in 20. I'll be back then. God. Continuing her Just act as a cleaner, Anyetta made her way into Dominic's office, idea. priming his chandelier for the accidental kill. She stood in wait at the door to the adjoining room, and it wasn't long before Dominic's returned, with a surprise guest. Come, take a seat, Miss Pendrell. What a grand office you have, Mr. Dominic's, and a chandelier as well. It's a standard size for everyone, so... I have a new proposition for you. Have you now? I can provide a significant donation to your cause in exchange for you withdrawing from your crusade against me and all public speaking arrangements you have booked for the next year. That is a very generous offer, Mr. Dominix, but I will have to decline. No amount of money you offer will stop my crusade, as you put it. Another offer. We work together. In addition to the donation to your cause, we find an amicable solution that benefits both our parties. I will not be taking any of your money, Mr. Dominix. Partners, then. Money is not the issue. You are. Since you don't realise it, I'm going to try something new. Really? Have you met my elven work colleague? Uncertain at what Miss Pendrel was planning, Anyetta took this as a cue to reveal herself, stepping into the room and startling both Dominix and Miss Pendrel. The shocks didn't stop there, however, as the cupboard burst open and Nerus leapt out, bow and arrow in hand, and firing a shot into Dominic's shoulder. Oh, you shot me! Yes, she did, which my other elven colleague will assist you with. What? Get to healing him, Mr. Vo. Where did you come from? Heal him now. 
You see, Mr. Dominic, you didn't realise the weight your words and policies carry, how much pain they cause to so many people. Someone like you would never care to know, would never entertain the thought of considering someone else's feelings. And we could give you the callow treatment. Like something from his stories, where the guy with a heart of stone realises the burdens he's caused others and changes his ways. But this isn't fiction, but we will be nothing more than phantoms by the time we're done with you. So, we're gonna hurt ya! <coughs> to give you a taste of what you're doing! But nothing we could do to you will ever compare to the pain you cause others. Should we go for one of his fingers? Yes, but how? Letter opener or hammer? Decisions, decisions. You got the healing magic going there, Nyata. Guys, I just wanted to crush him with a chandelier. Too quick for someone like him. Well, it wouldn't be an instant death. Why are you doing this? We had a plan set to go. It was a good plan, but we decided to mix it up a bit. We can hurt you as much as we want, then heal you when we're done. No evidence. If it makes you feel better, Mr. Vo, we can haul him under the chandelier and... Stage a dropping on him. Guaranteed squishing there. Now, Emma to pliers, would ya? Oh, look, can we please stop? Why? This is getting out of hand. You, you're doing this all wrong. Why should we listen to you? Who are you anyway? What's that accent you're putting on? I'm putting on an accent? You're one to talk. What are you trying to say, Miss Devo? Look, I like a bit of torture as much as the next guy. And if there's anyone more deserving, it's Peter Dominic's. But all we could be doing is making things worse. The plan we had, I wasn't sold on it myself, but killing him like this ain't the answer. Rough him up, threaten him, make him leave the country and never return. We could do that, but this, an execution. I mean, I like executions too, especially with the torture and if the guy deserves it. But, but anyway, this is too much. Maybe. I'll swear, I'll leave the country. If I have to, I'll resign. I'll leave politics. Please, don't kill me. You may be right, Miss Devo. Miss Pendrel, I am reconsidering your offer. I shall look over your policies with a fine tooth and comb Wait. and find ways to fix this. What do you say? Fine tooth and comb. Nah, he's a dickhead. Kill him. Oh. A while later, Agneta returned home to the vestiment silver, Morrigan seeing her off. This is your payment. Don't spend it all at once. Cheer up. I thought you did this kind of thing all the time. Mm. It is a good place you got here. Might come back sometime for one of those cakes your friend Charlotte makes. Stay out of trouble. So, how'd it go? It took a turn. Did you go through with it? Through with what? Did you, you know, kill him? Let's just say Peter Dominic's won't be causing any more problems for the future. But that's too vague. Did you kill him or not? Would you think less of me if I told you? i think less of you if you didn't. I shall answer. When I feel like it. I just... I don't feel great about it. That's fair. Take the time you need, but you will tell me, right? Of course, Charlie. Right then. Charlie, I was wondering if you were free to go dress shopping. Sure am. Let me grab my bag. But I thought you didn't like people calling you Charlie. No. I just don't like you calling me Charlie. Later, Agnetha. Huh. The Misadventures of Agnetha DeVoe, starring Liz Corrick as Agnetha, Sky LeBeau as Charlotte, Nora Holman, Morgan. Mara Blackledge as Neris. Judith H. as Maud Pendrill. Royce Pendergast as Termel. Gerard Foley as Peter Dominics. Melanie Christodoulou as Prime Minister Anderson. Award Chair Arika Wana of Flobuchair, playing the role of Crier. And Michael Mengada as the narrator. Theme music composed by Matt Harris. Frolic, performed by Royce Pentagast. Additional music by Kevin McLeod of Incompetech.com. Produced by City Park Radio 2022.